Well, good morning, church, and welcome to worship, whether you're joining us at our central campus, our, our Lake Carroll campus, or where we do so much ministry every day of the week at our Six Mile campus, or even if you're joining us online today, this is a little different, isn't it? Uh, I'm not in Temple Terrace, where I normally am when I'm coming before you preaching God's Word. I'm actually with one of our mission teams that are today worshiping in London, and we'll be connecting with our mission partners there and with those in France. So please pray for us that God uses this time uh, as we go from our city across the street, as we do on a daily basis, and around the world. Now, I'd like you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Romans chapter 12. That's where in a moment we'll be as we continue this study that we've been doing for months through the book of Romans. We begin a new series today that we're calling How to Change the World. I don't know about you, but I want to be a world changer. The, the reality is I'm, I'm standing at, at what has been and, and what will be the, the final stop for the physical remains of thousands of people. The, the reality is people are buried outside and we're here in a mausoleum where the physical remains of Again, hundreds if not thousands of people lie. In fact, one of the founding members of our church, Mr. and Ms. Pressure, this mausoleum is where their family came to lay them to rest. And this is a special place. But as I stand here, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that what has been true throughout history is, is still true today. 100 out of every 100 people die we all come to the end of this journey and we'll end up somewhere like this based on the arrangements we have made or the arrangements that our family makes for us. We may not know the date, but there are some things we do know. Life is short, a lot shorter than we think. It's frail. It goes by quickly. Death is certain. Everybody dies. When we're born, we come with an expiration date. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. And as we've been learning in Romans, God is sovereign. So we trust Him through this short journey of life as we head toward death. And, and we trust His control and His Lordship over everything we face. I've been thinking about death a, a good bit lately. Primarily because as a family we've been grieving. My dear father-in-law, my, my wife's daddy passed away in January and leaves a huge hole in our life. What a great and godly man he is, and yet still we mourn his loss. Even this week, I, I walked with a family uh, grieving a, a tragic early death. It's so difficult to, to walk through that on, on this side of heaven. I, I walk around this place and I, I think about what people go through Next week, in France, I'll be walking in the American Cemetery, again, in Normandy, in France. And on one day, D-Day, more than 9,000 Americans alone lost their lives and are buried in that sacred ground. In fact, we are here today in a very large part because of their sacrifice, the difference that they made. But what about us? Does our life before this point make any difference at all? Do our sacrifices impact others? Do we just go through life going through the motions, doing what we're told? Or is it possible? Can we make a difference in this world and what takes place around us? I, I think we can change the world. In fact, anytime I hear that phrase, change the world, I, I think about that young executive, the young CEO of Apple, Steve Jobs, who was recruiting a new leader. So he went to one of the largest corporations in our nation, PepsiCo, the Pepsi company. And he began to recruit it, a man named John Scully. John Scully said, there's no way I would come with this startup and this thing I don't even understand. You would have to give me a million dollar signing bonus and a million dollars a year and a million for this and a million for that. And Steve Jobs didn't miss a beat. This is what he said to him. Do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugar water? 
Or, or do you want to come with me and have a chance to change the world? I don't know about you, but man, I want to change the world. I, I, I want to do whatever it takes. Are you willing to do whatever it takes? It was that famous British cricketer, that game that we don't play much here in our nation, cricket. His name was C.T. Studd. It, it's C.T. Studd, I, I think, that first said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I, I want us to see what Christ would have us do to make a lasting difference as world changers. We're going to see that in Romans 12. But first, I want to pray with you once more. Father, so again, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you that even with technology and in a setting like this, we can come into your presence and we can seek to hear from you. So speak to us giving us what we need that we don't have, teaching us what we've not yet learned, making us new and different for your glory. We want to be transformed. Lord, I say that for my life. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. Lord, you're my strength. You're my redeemer. And may the result of this time together, may it change your world. In the name of Jesus, amen. Look with me in Romans chapter 12. We're going to begin reading in in verse 1. This is the Word of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. When we come to Romans 12, as we've journeyed through this entire letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Rome, we discover something important. The purpose of our salvation The power of the gospel is so much more than a plan simply to save you from the eternal consequences of sin. It's God's plan to replace the world system of Satan with the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. Yes, God wants to spend forever with you. And yes, when you begin a relationship with him, when you are saved, that theme of Romans, you get heaven as a benefit. But there's more than that. He wants the life that you live as a saved child of God to change the world in which you live. So there's consequence. I want you to see how this verse began, and you're going to be familiar with this word and what I say every time we see it. Therefore, remember what my preacher daddy taught me. Whenever you see therefore in the Bible, you look back and see What is this there for? Now, what has Romans been all about? It's a book about salvation or soteriology, the doctrine of what it means to be saved. There have been several chapters that begin with the word therefore. And and these are big hinges on which this entire book of the Bible swings as we think about our salvation. For example, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since you've been justified as a result of your relationship with Jesus Christ, you now have Peace with God. So because Jesus made it just as if we've never sinned, we can have peace with God, and then we can be agents of peace for God. Or Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that awesome? But this therefore is different. Therefore, it's reminding us again of of what Romans has been all about. In light of your salvation and and, in light of what you've learned about what it means to be saved, this is how you should live. It's a pendulum swing. It's a change. And and frankly, as you read through the New Testament, all of the letters written by Paul are like this. They start with what we believe and, and then they turn to how we should behave. It goes from our convictions to our conduct. It moves from doctrinal to practical. A theologian would say it goes from the indicatives to the imperatives. 
So I, I want you to see something here. You, you can't do what you should do unless you know and believe those things you know and believe. So it's important that we dive in and that we study and we try to understand these spiritual things that are taught in the Word of God. Our learning should always lead to our living. Some of you, like me, you've heard a lot of messages. Maybe not a lot, like you're hearing this one, but you've heard a lot of people teach the Bible. You've been to a lot of Sunday school classes. If that's the case, your life should be different. We should be different because of what we know. If you want to see an illustration of that, just look at any child. They live their lives with open eyes. And as a result, as they watch their parents, they begin to parrot their parents. They repeat and they live out what they've seen and experienced. And sometimes we don't like that. Sometimes we feel like we're surprised by that. That's why when I talk to a couple that's coming together for marriage, I always talk to them about their families of origin because whether we like it or not, we walk into every relationship, every situation, pulling that carry-on bag like we'll pull through an airport or into a hotel. And that's the baggage we take with us. So with that in mind, Paul says, therefore, I urge you. Now, I want to stop there because that phrase, I urge you, in the Greek, I don't, I don't talk about the Greek often because I don't want you to think you can't just see the simplicity of Scripture. But that word is a word that we would pronounce this way, parakaleo. And it means to come alongside. But if you're familiar with the teaching of Scripture, maybe you recognize that the verb form of this is the paraclete, the one who comes alongside. And who is our paraclete? That's the word that the Bible uses for the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God that comes into us when we begin that relationship with Him. God is indwelling us, coming alongside us. And so now Paul's saying, I want to come alongside you as God's Spirit has come alongside you and encourage you to make a difference. Now, what's the first thing he says as he says, I urge you or I come alongside you? First, he says, there's a decision that you need to make. And I would say that to you today. There's a decision that you need to make. Look again at these verses. Verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Paul is very clear. The Christian life is a sacrifice. Now, to his Jewish listeners, and he was writing to both Jews and Gentiles, remember, if you're not born of a Jewish ethnic heritage, then like me, you are a Gentile. He was writing to Jews and Gentiles. But the reality is the Jews would have understood this. Their system, it was a sacrificial system. In fact, that's how they would get right with God. They would take an animal, maybe a, a lamb, and they would sacrifice that lamb. And the shed blood of that dead animal, that sacrifice, would pay for their sin, and then they thus would be right with God. That's why it became significant when, when Jesus said he was the Lamb of God. He became the sacrifice, and he did die for our sins. But this is different. This says we are a living sacrifice. Well, we shouldn't be surprised that the Christian faith cost us. We're told to be crucified with Christ. Jesus said to take up your cross and follow me. The New Testament tells us to die daily. But this sacrifice is a living sacrifice. And think about that. What can a living sacrifice do? It can do what we do, which is to crawl off of the altar and say, I, I don't want this. I don't want to go through this. Living sacrifice, that's an oxymoron. You, you know what an oxymoron is? It says kind of two different things, like this one. Uh, tax return. <laughs> no, tax return. Or this one, pretty ugly. Maybe that's a southern thing, but we used to say that now. He's pretty ugly. We'd never say that about a woman, uh, of course. Or how about this one? Working vacation. Oxymoron. Or same difference. What? What does that mean? Or here's maybe the best one. Government organization. Nope, <laughs> not going to happen. These are oxymorons and living sacrifice is an oxymoron. And because of this, Paul is saying to us, what we have to remember if we're a living sacrifice is this is a daily 
presentation of ourselves to the Lord. On a daily basis, I have to recommit myself to the Lord. Yes, you begin a relationship with Christ once and for all. Whether you were like me as a child or many of you as adults or whether that time has not yet come and it ends up being today, there's a moment in your life, the Bible calls it being born again. And that assures your eternal salvation. But on a daily basis, we present ourselves to Christ. We recommit ourselves to Him. What does daily sacrifice look like for you? How, how does that take place? Maybe it's before your feet hit the floor when you wake up in the morning and you just say every day, Lord, give me words today and thoughts today and actions today that are pleasing to you. Maybe you'd pray that model prayer and include things in your life like deliver me from temptation. Maybe you'd read through something like Psalms 23 and be reminded that he does deliver us even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. What, whatever helps you come to that point of daily commitment, that's what God wants in your life. But there's another thing in addition to the fact that it's a living sacrifice. This sacrifice is different because it's not for our salvation or, or for the forgiveness of our sin. This sacrifice is out of gratitude for what God has done for us. It's in response to what we've already received. Remember what Scripture teaches. Scripture doesn't teach, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. But it teaches, I'm accepted, therefore I obey. When you truly understand this Christian faith, what you understand is because of what Jesus Christ has done for me, because Jesus died for my sin, because he endured my pain and he encountered my shame, because of all of that and the forgiveness and grace I've received from him, then out of gratitude, I want to give back. I want to live my life for his glory. In other words, in light of what Jesus has done for me, why would I not want him to have every bit of me? I mentioned that great quote from C.T. Studd. Let me tell you a little more about him. When I said he played cricket in Great Britain, he was one of the best. Think of like LeBron today. All right, let's bring it home. The one that just retired from Tampa Bay, the GOAT, Tom Brady. Imagine just walking away at the prime of your career, walking away from the fame, from the wealth, in that moment, this is what C.T. Studd said. If Jesus Christ be God and he died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Now, most of us aren't walking away from that kind of fame and fortune. But we still need to have that mentality, a living sacrifice. But notice how that sacrifice is described. It's holy. Do you know what holy means? Completely set apart. Different, unlike anything else. So we are to be set apart. Consecrated is a great word for the purpose of God. That's what God wants you to do. You want to change the world and make a difference for him. It's not going to happen if you just go through your normal life and your, your daily living as if nothing is different. But when we're holy, what this passage says is that we're pleasing to God. Unless you're a sick person, you want to please those you love. I'll do anything to please my wife. I'll go to extreme measures to please my children. Sometimes I'll spoil them more than I should. But if, if I love the Lord with all my heart and soul and mind and strength, if he is the number one love of my life, shouldn't my life be lived to bring him pleasure? And here's what it says. When I daily am that living sacrifice for him, counting the cost for what it means to be a child of God, then he finds great pleasure. When we set our lives apart for his service, he's pleased. But there are more. Look again at verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers... And sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Then notice, this is your true and proper worship. Not only is the Christian life a sacrifice, the Christian life is worship. And oh, on a Sunday morning, it's so important that you get this. Worship is not simply something we go to. Worship is the life we live as followers of Christ. 
Worship is not simply a song, but as the song says, I give you more than a song. That's the heart of worship. Yes, God is worthy of our singing. And whether you're a man or a woman or, or you sing like someone famous on the radio or you can't carry a tune in the bucket, when you come together to worship, you should sing your praises to the Lord. But worship is so much more than a song. The heart of worship is that we give God us let me see if I can explain that to you. Worship speaks of worth. So we worship what we deem worthy. That's why we can have false worship. We can have idol worship even in our day and in our setting, in our life, even being raised in a Baptist church. I can be guilty of idolatry and worshiping those things that are not God. How do I know if that's true? Well, I begin to determine what is important to me. I don't give God His true and proper worship if, if I'm giving something else more important focus in my life. So let me just ask you several questions. And, and maybe as, as you think about these questions, there, there's not a wrong answer, but maybe it'll just help you determine what, what you're worshiping. Like, here's this first one. I most worry about losing, and fill in that blank, I'm most worried about losing my family. I'm most worried about losing my career. I'm most worried about losing my finances or my reputation. All of these things are they're important things. Nothing wrong. I just want to help you think. How about this question? I'm most concerned with gaining. What do you live your life to gain? Where's the focus? Is it, is it to increase that bank account? Is it, is it to get a, a mate? Is it to have more friends? Is it, is it to have more followers or, or, or people that are a part of your network on social media? Well, what, what drives you? What are you trying to acquire? Not bad stuff, right? Even a boat, a mountain house. That's not a bad thing, but what's driving you? How about this one? I most want to change. What do you most want to change? What is that that is just grasping your heart? Or, or some that go a little deeper. I'm unwilling to forgive blank. Do you have that list? Hey, I'm a pretty forgiving person, but now if you do this, I'm not going there. Or I'll never get over blank. You do that to me? Or I have to walk through this illness? Or I encounter this problem? Or just turn that to the positive, because these are not bad things. I'm just helping you think. Maybe you'd say, I get the most comfort from blank. What do you get the most comfort from? Is that someone in your life? Is it sexual activity? Is it some kind of substance you put into your body? Something you drink? A drug you take? Something you view? Not bad. Some of these don't have to be bad things. We could go on and on. These feelings aren't bad, but they expose something about us. They expose what we consider, listen, worthy. What we consider worthy of our time, of, of our energy, of our influence, of our, our resources, of us. And as we've walked through Romans, what we've learned very clearly is there's only one. There's only one who's truly worthy of it all. We even sing that to him. We sing worthy, worthy of it all. Jesus is the only one truly worthy of our worship. Everything or everyone else will always leave us longing for more. That, that's why after you come down from the high, you got to hit it again. That's why after the adrenaline in you or the endorphins in you begin to get met and satisfied by that illicit relationship, soon you, you find yourself wanting more. That's why when you keep going back to the fridge, there's never enough. Because if, if you're using things that don't even necessarily have to be bad things to be the thing in your life, you're always going to come up short. So there's a decision we have to make. Will we present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and, and pleasing to God as a 
as a pure and acceptable and right and true act of worship. I think about the old preacher story of the little boy. He was a newspaper carrier, but he didn't have any money. He knew he made money, but this day he didn't have any. And he went to church and he listened to the preacher and the preacher told everybody to give what they had. And he didn't have anything. So after the offering plate was passed, it was taken back, taken back down to the front. He leaves his seat. He walks to the front. He takes that plate off the table. He puts it on the floor. And he steps into that offering plate. He looked up at the preacher and he said, I don't, I don't have much to give. But here I am. I can't think of a much better way to describe what it means to follow Christ Oswald Chambers, who I read most mornings, says the only one thing you can dedicate to God is your right to you. Surrendering control of you. I want you to know today that God wants yourself before He wants any substance or service from you. You're going to hear us in this place and in this space talk about how God wants you to give back to Him and how He wants you to serve Him. But before He wants your substance or your service, He wants yourself. Because when you put your yes on the table, everything else is just a consequence. So let, let's just say what I believe is the Holy Spirit of God is, is knocking on your heart's door and your mind is just racing as you think through this and, and you know you want to make that kind of decision. How do you do that? Well, Paul tells us the only way. He says, by the mercies of God, literally because of God's compassion for you, that's how you do this. It's not in your own strength, but it's God's mercy. You become a living sacrifice. And when you become a living sacrifice, then you discover something else. This is number two. You discover there's always a difference when Christ is in your life. It really is true. Listen to verse two. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. When Christ is in our life, it becomes a transformed life. That's why Paul would go on to say in another passage, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has passed away. All things have become new. And he uses the same word, a transformed life, not a conformed life. A conformed life is like that of a piece of pottery that is molded and, and shaped and while we want to be molded and shaped by God, that's usually not the way it works when we're conformed. We're conformed into the area we are. We become more like a chameleon. And so we look like the world, even though Jesus has told us we're in the world, but not of the world. No, God wants you to be a nonconformist. And in our day, that should be popular. It seems like that's what everybody wants to be. Did you know that's part of our faith? We're not to be conformist. We're to be transformed. You're either going to be molded into a pattern that someone else has for you, or you're going to be made completely new, totally brand new by Christ. The problem in our society is that many who profess to follow Christ, they say they've been changed, whether they've walked down an aisle or raised a hand or prayed a prayer or been baptized, they've joined a church. They profess change, but they don't seem to possess change. So how do we experience this change? It, it's clear in this verse. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. And that takes us back to Jesus, doesn't it? Because this was his message. He used a word in the English we would say repent. But the word he used, metanoia, would literally mean a change of mind, a change of your willful volition. And Paul is saying, when you have that mind change and, and you replace the way you think with the way God thinks, we call that the mind of Christ. When that takes place, that kind of repentance, your life looks differently. For about 30 years, I've served as a pastor. And here's what I've discovered. A lot of our seats are filled with people who are trying to change their lives, but they've never let God change their minds. Maybe you need to repent today. 
Turn to Jesus. It's a good place for me just to remind you of the truth of the gospel. The Bible says that every one of us, regardless of what family you were born into, whether your family went to church or never darkened the doors, you were, you were born separated from God because of sin. And that sin is not just something you've done. It's who you are. You are a sinner, according to God's Word, the Bible. And that sin has to be punished, and, and there's only one punishment. And the punishment is forever death. And God doesn't want you to experience that forever death. He wants you to experience forever life. That's why the Bible says, and we've talked about this verse a bunch, Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates His love in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you've never begun that relationship with Christ, I hope today will be today that you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead and that you are saved. When you do, you experience a transformed life. And when that takes place, when you encounter the difference that Jesus makes in us, the reality is now you have a direction you'll follow. The number one question I'm asked as a pastor is, Pastor, how do I know God's will? Who should I marry? What job should I take? How do I know whether or not to move? How do I know whether or not to spend this? How do I know whether or not to, to make this decision? How do I know and do the will of God? And the problem is often people are looking for God's direction, but they've not made a decision and they've not experienced the difference that he makes. Because when you do, here's what it says. Look again, that last phrase. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good and His pleasing and His perfect will. Did you hear that? You can know and do God's will. His good and His pleasing and His perfect will. When, God, when you give God all of you, He gives you the desires of your heart. That's what the psalmist says. Commit your ways to the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. What does that mean? When my way and my will is aligned with God's way and God's will, He gives me what I need to find fulfillment on this side of heaven. So let me see if I can wrap this up. When you count the cost and become willing to sacrifice who you are for the will of God, He will show you the very purpose for which you're created. So count the cost. I can't think about these two verses, verses I learned as a child without thinking about that hymn I sung as a child in that Baptist church in South Carolina. I wish I memorized the words, but allow me just to read these to you and let them soak over your heart and mind. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice, let me sing, always only for my King. Take my lips and, and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as you choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at your feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. I don't know about you, but I want to live that consecrated life, a living sacrifice holy, pleasing to God. I, I want to live a life in, in which the things I do make a difference on this side of heaven. And I want to walk according to His will. So how about it? You ready to change the world? Let's go change the world together. Bow your heads together with me. As you bow your heads, I just want to challenge you today. What needs to be adjusted? If you are a follower of Christ, what needs to be adjusted? Remember, it's a daily sacrifice. Don't climb off of that altar today. Do business with God. Are you walking in accordance with His will? If not, what's it going to take to get back in line? 
Do business with Him today. Count the cost. Live a life in a way that honors and pleases Him. But, but some of you have never begun that relationship with Jesus. If not, I, I believe the Bible says today is the day of salvation. So here's what you need to do. And you don't need a pastor or a priest to help you do this. You just call out to God. That's what the Bible says. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believing in your heart God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Confess Him as your Lord today. Repent. Ask Him to renew your mind. And follow Jesus. So Father, I pray You take this time as You take our lives. Let it be, Lord consecrated for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.